Hi, everyone, and welcome back to The Nick Hilaire Show. Our guest today is Wolf Richter, the publisher of the popular finance website, Wolf Street. Wolf, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Nick. Yeah, man, I've been I've been following your work for quite some time. I must say that the, the Wolf Street website is an incredibly impressive resource. And I understand from sort of talking to you the other day that all of this research, all of these articles, essentially doing yourself, which in and of itself is an amazing feat. I, I encourage all my listeners to check this website out because you can learn a lot about the economy. Uh, is it is that tr am I right that you're just doing this all on your own? Yeah, I'm a one man shop. <laughs> and and tell me, like, I it's it's hard to do justice to to the website just sitting here, you know, voice to voice. But just for our, our listeners' uh, benefit, it's an incredible treasure trove of real time analysis on the economy and occasionally on the markets and market action itself, and that. The, the subject matter is covered with such integrity and depth that it's really an incredible resource. And I, I wanted to start this conversation, Wolf, by just going back to the beginning. I know it wasn't always called Wolf Street, but when you first sat down and said, you know what, I want to write a finance website, what was going on in, in your mind at that time? Yeah, so that was coming out of the financial crisis. And uh, so 2000. 11 really when I came up with that and the the original name was testosterone pit and that's the original website and you still go to testosteronepit.com and it forwards to wallstreet.com and uh, at the time I'd also written a book with the same title testosterone pit but that was about auto dealer salesman so that's a completely different thing and and that's where the name came from testosterone pit a uh a place where where a lot of testosterone goes the wrong way and and uh, and so I was really pissed off about the bailouts about the financial crisis and and about a lot of stuff that was going on back then and I decided I just I just needed to air some of the things I was seeing and discussing them in public and um and so I started doing that. And of course, I'd never uh, operated a website like that before. So it was a huge learning curve. And one of the things I had to learn the hard way was that testosterone pit, the name itself, is a problem on the Internet. And for all kinds of reasons, because, you know, the ads that you track on your site have all yeah, their supplements and things like that. And and it gets blocked and people don't email it and don't share it and don't click on it. So I had to change the name to Wolf Street. And uh, so that's one of the lessons I learned after a couple of years. But the the principle has been the same. I'm uh, I'm not nearly as pissed off anymore as I was. I've kind of settled down over the over the years. Uh, but the 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 effort now is 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 the same. It's more detailed. Uh, it's more knowledgeable about this stuff, which is to reveal uh, to to everybody really. Uh, what I see in business finance and money, as I say, and um, and it's gotten to be pretty big. It's a you know, it's it's a business, and I'm happy to have it. Yeah, it's uh, it's been going now. If if that was during the great financial crisis, it's been going on, man, fifteen, sixteen years or something, right? Yeah. So testosterone pit started in 2011, and I switched to Wall Street in uh, 2014. So nice. it's yeah it's it's about that time and and the financial crisis was really 2007 behind the scenes and and then publicly in in 2008 when a bunch of banks blew up and um and you know I was sitting on the outside I was in Europe in 2005 2006 and I saw this stuff happening uh, and I saw the cracks of the financial crisis and and every time I came back to the United States at the airport, you know, I, I would sit next to these uh, people that were flipping homes sight unseen. And, and you know, they had the day jobs. And in between, they were buying condos in Florida and then God knows what all. And, um, and I thought, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. This is going to blow up. And then we saw the serious cracks in 2006. And I put all my money out of the stock market too early. And... Um, and I got ready for this and I thought they would allow this to correct properly. And then 
they didn't, you know, they bailed everybody out and uh, nobody went to jail. And yeah, that's when I really, really, really got pissed off because there was a lot of wrongdoing going on at the time and uh, it was all condoned. And, you know, some of the people that did the stuff, you know, they became our public heroes and uh, it, uh, it, it just, just got to me. Yeah. I was sort of at a, a younger, younger point, earlier point in my career when this all happened. But I do remember feeling a similar kind of, for me, it wasn't so much anger, but maybe sort of confusion because in the midst of all this, you know, I had read a lot of financial history, right? And in previous blowups and banking crisis, like people got in trouble. And what we were watching and witnessing was, I forget which of the banking houses, but maybe it was Morgan or Merrill, but one of these individuals who basically blew that entity up, got like a $120 million exit package, like golden parachute that wasn't taken away. They paid it out in the midst of literally like a global banking crisis. And, and that to me was the moment where I was like, oh man, things are really different. And then there was all kinds of bailouts and nothing really happened. You know, there's been some people like you writing about it. And I, th I think there's even one decently high profile Ted talk uh, from a, about a decade ago where, where an individual is like, man, what, why didn't anybody go to jail? But nobody really talks about that anymore. Like how, how much of this stuff that brought the banking crisis to its knees was illegal in your mind? Yeah. I mean, that's, that would be good to know. I mean, we, we didn't really investigate either. So we don't really, we have no real idea what went on. I mean, we, we know the surface of it. You know, we, we've, we've seen the results and we've seen, uh, you know, some of the innards come out. Uh, but we've also seen that in 2009, uh, bonuses on Wall Street that were paid out were at a record high. And you know, that was after the bailouts. You know, that, that money that was thrown at Wall Street to bail everybody out triggered the biggest wave of bonuses ever. And instead of people going to jail, they got these massive bonuses. And, you know, it's it just Americans. I mean, you see it in the comments on my site. People are still pissed off about this stuff. It's, it's been over a decade. You know, and they're, they're still pissed off about all the stuff that was going on, about the bonuses being paid out uh, while these these companies were being, uh, the bonuses were being paid out, while the companies were being bailed out and by the Fed, and by the Federal Reserve, by the government, you know, all the entities jumped in to bail out the banking system and to bail out really the investors in the banking system, the bondholders and the stockholders in the, in the banking system. And, and the, the employees at these firms, from, from the CEOs down, they made enormous amounts of money during that time that, uh, that we bailed them out. And, you know, it's, the amount of anger at that time, I, I will never forget. And I, I still see that in the comments today. I mean, that's just uh, the thing that uh, when you look through the comments, occasionally it comes up and, and uh, these, these are the people that are really pissed off or the, the older people among the commenters and uh, that went through this. And some of them have been through, like me, we've been through the savings and loan crisis. So we kind of had a playbook how that should be worked out with people going to jail, with lots of people going to jail. And with companies being allowed to fail and with investors being taken to the cleaners. And uh, when that didn't happen, and that was under uh, President Bush Sr. And when that didn't happen this time around, um, and that's President Bush Jr. And, and then Obama and uh, ben Bernanke was at the Fed. And, and, and that's kind of, you know, where we were. And, and um, that left an indelible mark on, on people of my generation uh, it just destroyed a, a, um, a, a kind of a conviction that we have that in America, those kind of things would be punished in the capitalist way. You know, you, you just lose all you have. And, 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 you know, and, and then, and then there's a, uh, you know, a state of, uh, of law that that's going after you. And, um, you know, we didn't see any of that. Yeah. After we talked about this, um, gosh, I guess it was yesterday, I was thinking and comparing in my mind the government reaction to the cryptocurrency stuff, which is a similar saga in a sense. I, there, there was probably more outright fraud, obviously, in the crypto era. But interestingly, 
the government is going after the crypto scammers and seeking to you know, punish people who have broken the law. And it's in stark contrast to these bankers, which I think that in and of itself is kind of an interesting you know, com uh, comparison to, to think about. Yeah, that's good observation. Obviously, the scale is a lot different. I think the government back then was worried that if they went after the multi-trillion dollar banks and their their executives, that the consequences would be a huge uh, mess. And you know, to some extent, that's true. Uh, the banking system is essential for this economy. It's like a, a financial utility. We have to have it. It's like your electric utility, and you know, if if it does wrong, you can't just turn it off. You know, you need the electricity uh, to to run an economy. And the same with the banking system; it processes payments, it makes a lot of things possible. It it, uh, it issues loans, it funds stuff. You know, so it, it takes deposits. These are all things that are crucial. But you you can leave the bank alive, and take the investors out, and uh, take the bondholders out. And uh, that's how it used to be done. The FDIC is set up to do that. And a bunch of banks, smaller banks, were actually handled that way. I mean, they, uh, they, they were taken down. And, um, and that's how, uh, uh, you know, that should have been done all the way through. And, and it wasn't. And, and still nobody went to jail, even among the banks that, that, that were taken down. So I think there was a real fear that uh, this would... Uh, become a, a global uh, financial collapse that would uh, that would then entail an economic collapse and and so they they didn't want to do any of that and and you know the, the problem was over a couple years later and um, it they could have prosecuted people back then but but then they didn't so you know it just got swept under the rug yeah. And when, when you think, when you compare the, the government intervention during that era, when the, the banking system was bailed out with sort of like what happened at Silicon Valley Bank, let's say last year, are there differences in the, in the treatment between the two? Because I guess the Silicon Valley Bank equity got wiped out, right? Yeah, so that was different. That's very different. And I think I somewhat learned the lesson. Uh, all of the... Yeah, so the the shareholders or the the equity value of, of Silicon Valley Bank was wiped out, and um, the holding company still exists, but it filed for bankruptcy, and uh, uh, the bondholders. So these are the preferred stockholders in Silicon Valley Bank. They got wiped out. So investors uh, got wiped out in the bank, and the insured depositors were made whole as they should be because that's deposit insurance. And the thing that was different is that the uninsured depositors were also made whole. And instead of them getting a haircut and guessing the haircut might have been, uh, you know, modest, uh, it might they might have gotten back 90% or 80% of the deposits after a while. You know, that's how the FDIC will do it. They take all the assets and sell the assets. And then what's left over after the regular depositors are paid, the uninsured depositors get. And, and that wouldn't have been the end of the world. But uh, then they were, you know, fearful of contagion spreading and these uninsured depositors yanking the money out of a bunch of other banks. And that was kind of happening. And uh, so they made those whole. And that was a bailout of depositors, not of investors. And the executives lost their jobs. And, and so they, they, were, yeah, they didn't get any bonuses for that. And, and so it, it, was a, uh, it was kind of a standard procedure how to resolve a bank, except that the, the uninsured depositors. And those were wealthy people. So that's the thing that caused a hoot and cry because those were incredibly wealthy people. Billionaires got, got bailed out here. They had lots of money there on deposits, uh, venture capitalists, uh, crypto firms, and, and all kinds of entities that Silicon Valley breeds. And, and yeah, they, they got bailed out and, and uh, got their money back. Instead of getting 90% or 80% of the money back, they got 100% of the money back. And instead of having to wait three weeks or something, you know, they got it back on the spot, essentially. So, um, but 
that was very different still than the bailouts during the financial crisis. And all the banks that got uh, resolved in all the three banks that got resolved in 2023 were handled the same way. All depositors got the money back. Uh, investors lost their shirts. Executives were fired. And, uh, you know, that the bonuses weren't paid. And, and, and so it was and I'm kind of a cage with how that was done, actually. OK. Yeah, I was just listening to you give that answer. It sounded like that is a better, in your mind, a much better outcome. What do you think about specifically the bailout of the uninsured depositors? Do you think that that was a wise decision? Well, I wouldn't have done it. I don't think it was necessary. Uh, they were, I mean, so the, the situation was this, that you had a bunch of uh, well-funded young companies, startups uh, that were uninsured depositors at the bank. And so they had payroll coming up. And uh, so typically the uninsured deposits, uh, they might get a portion, the FDIC would estimate something, you know, they, they would pay out a portion of that. You get some kind of uh, certificate for that and you can, you can uh, turn that into money, that certificate. And it would be maybe for 30% or 40% or 50% of your deposit. So within a week that could have met the payroll and, uh, but they, they had payroll coming up in the next few days. And so that was an issue. And they could have expedited that. And, and then there were the larger issues that these were very well connected, very powerful, very wealthy people and big political donors. And so this was a whole other you know, element that, that played into this. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think it was unnecessary. I, I think it was a bad example. Um, but, you know, of all the bad things they could have done, that was probably the least bad. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not as bad as like a, what happened in 08, 09. Yeah. I mean, look, there's a, there's a, before actually the GFC, there was a conspiracy theory in this country that this sort of plutocracy is basically in control in some capacity or another. And even like sort of high profile, serious people are writing books about it. Like I had Martin Wolf uh, from the financial times on the podcast uh, last summer. And he wrote a whole book that was essentially about his view on how the system has been captured by the ultra wealthy. And, you know, in, in, in both of these instances, you know, you could point to those if you believe that theory and it's probably partially true, if not completely true, it's true. The system is being, manipulated in a sense to protect the interests of this small group of people who happen to have all of the financial assets. Yeah. And it, it's a shame that, uh, this is the case. Uh, it's also a shame that conspiracy theories come around, uh, and that confuse everything. So I think money is a real issue. The concentration of wealth is a real issue. And, uh, the concentration of corporate power is an enormous issue. And I see that every day on, on my own, in my own little bailiwick here with advertisement. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do. It goes through Google. <laughs> you know, yeah, it just, yeah. that's how it is that the infrastructure of advertising, the, the pipelines, you know, they're, they're run by Google. And, um, you know, Google needs to be split up into 100 million little companies. And, and so they, you have other huge companies like that that have an enormous amount of power um, and a lot of them are getting government subsidies. I mean, that's what we're looking at the chip sector right now. These are some of the wealthiest companies. And Intel is looking at getting $10 billion from the government to build a factory in the United States. I mean, it's just that, that kind of stuff. You know, how can that happen? Well, this, this is this concentration of wealth and power and it's self-propagating. And, and that's, a, that's a real issue in this country. And it's a real issue in other countries, too. And, and um, uh, you know, I mean, what are we going to do about it? We can talk about it and we can try to uh, to shed some light on it. And, you know, we can vote and uh, we can do those kinds of things that we do. And, and then, you know, <laughs> you run out yeah. of things to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, the, the, the Chips Act is, is an interesting um, idea or, or issue to explore. Like we talked about that yesterday as well. And I again, I hadn't thought about it that way before because I sort of viewed it as a very positive uh, policy, because I, I do feel like there's like a good business case for incentivizing that that activity. But then, after we spoke and and you sort of articulated the 
a partial counter narrative to it, which is like, man, does N- NVIDIA need any money right now? Does Intel need any money? Probably not, right? There's a bunch of other people in this country who do, like people who are struggling to afford housing and healthcare and stuff. And so there is a sense in which, even though it might be good policy, it is benefiting that same small group of people who maybe don't need the incentive. Maybe we should just tell them to put the f- facility here in America. Yeah. Well, another way to do this uh, we we talk about the government deficit. You know, it's over two trillion dollars last year. Uh, we we need money. The government needs money, and big time, massively, and uh, it has to borrow all this money. So that 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 deficit spending and has to issue bonds, and that's getting expensive because you know you have to pay interest on it for forever. And uh, so one way uh, to raise money is to put tariffs on imports. And if you, and yeah, that's just a tax and it's a tax that impacts the corporate profit margins and maybe they can pass it on or maybe they cannot pass it on. Generally expenses are hard to pass on, but it, it, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a tax on corporations that import and they don't have to pay that tax if they don't import, if they build a factory here in the United States. So instead of giving them $10 billion to build a factory, you, uh, you put tariffs on their, on on the imports of semiconductors and whatever else that they're building outside, and um, and 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 then you raise billions of dollars from in in new revenues. And if if uh, companies get tired of paying it, they can build a factory in near Austin, Texas, and and build the semiconductors there. And 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 that that's the other way. And and. Uh, a lot of com- countries are doing that. You know, they protect their, their economy and they have an industrial policy and, you know, Germany, Japan, China, they have all, you know, massively organized industrial policies. And uh, some, some of them are incentives and some of them are tariffs and some of them are administrative protections. And, and, um, and it, yeah, that's the other way. You don't have to throw money at the richest companies in the world. Yeah, these these essentially these monopolies, as you as you mentioned, like one uh, on that point. Before I forget, I wanted to mention. I don't know if you heard this, but there's a Silicon Valley sort of legend who is out maybe a year ago talking at a school or something. Peter Thiel, who's a sort of controversial figure in in his own way. I, I, he was a teacher of mine, so I don't really have the same relationship as sort of the general public with him. I've, I've known him somewhat personally over are you, the years. Are you being serious, a real teacher in school? Yeah, he was. A, <laughs> he taught a class at my law school, actually, um, which was really fascinating. He was a great. He was a great lecturer. He has. He's. A, he has like interesting ideas, but he gave this talk where basically, I think it may have been Stanford Business School. He was somewhere where he articulated the truth of the Silicon Valley ethos, which is that they are trying to build monopolies. They're doing it on purpose because that's how you create a unicorn. And I think the the sort of silent implication, which he didn't delve into, at least in the public remarks that I saw, is that they know Silicon Valley executives and technologists, they know that the government is going to be really slow to catch up if they ever catch up at all on the antitrust side of it, because these are complicated in- industries. Like Amazon, for example, has been you know running ahead of the FTC for years. And I just think it's fascinating that that's sort of the, they're so emboldened that they are, they're willing to just put it out there into the world. Like, Hey, we're trying to create monopolies and yeah. there's laws on our books, which are anti-monopoly for years or almost a hundred years now, maybe over a hundred years now. What do you think of that? Well, he nailed it. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, that's what it is. And, and I mean, you, you have the, uh, the kill zone around these big companies were like Apple or Google or Amazon, and they will, big companies will then buy all the startups that can potentially threaten them. And, and so, in you know, of course, you have this, the, 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 the VCs like that and Silicon Valley likes that because these companies pay a lot of money to buy these startups and it doesn't really matter to Apple how much it overpays for a little startup. And then they shut it down and they keep a few engineers and, and, uh, and the competitor is gone. And so that has come under investigation now uh, at, by the FTC. Uh, you know, Google is, 
<laughs> you know, there's, it's being sued all over the place now and, and, and antitrust investigation started. And, and so, and the interesting thing is that what I mentioned a little while ago is that uh, publishers, big publishers, not just me, but big publishers like uh, the, the Wall Street Journal and, and the organization, the Murdoch uh, organization that, that has all these other publications, you know, they, they're now standing behind that and uh, they're all paying the price uh, for these huge mon monopolies. Uh, and it's not the consumers that get hurt here. And that's the, that, that was the problem for many years that you, it was the, originally the, the laws were designed to protect uh, consumers from, from being price gouged when there's a monopoly, but it's the consumers aren't paying for any of this stuff. It's free. What, who is paying for it are the publishers and, and, uh, sometimes the advertisers and, and our other people in the industry. So that's a different, a different aspect of it. And, and so it'll be interesting legally to see how that, how that turns out. Obviously it's incredibly complex and it will take many, many years. And in the end, there'll be some kind of a settlement, you know, it'll be several billion dollars and it'll be considered huge. And, and, you know, Google will earn that kind of money in like six weeks and, uh, and be done with it and, and keep doing the same thing. And, and so that's once you have this, and Silicon Valley is is truly set up that way. Once you have this concentrated power, it's very difficult to for 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 a government to really knock it out. And I mean, things can change, and and competition can come along. And uh, I mean, TikTok might knock down YouTube, for example, and that might happen. And then people forget. And, and what was YouTube? I you remember what that was. And, you know, 10 years later and, and it's gone and, and that can happen. I mean, these technological changes can happen and can take all or some of those, those uh, things down and, and, but then there'll be something else. And, and so um, I think generally the government has in recent decades has waited way too long. I mean, there's some, uh, now they're going after them, but uh, it's and they're loathed by Silicon Valley for doing that. And yeah. uh, uh, but it's it's late, you know, and and uh, it's now now they're facing these gigantic powerhouses uh, that are very difficult to deal with. They're big political contributors, and uh, uh, you know they've created lots of billionaires, and they're individually contributors to 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 their political movements, and and so it it um, yeah at, at this point it's really tough to see how this is going to to really change but yeah that's i mean teal nailed it <laughs> it's just completely nailed it of course he knows he knows how that works and and um and they're spending billions of dollars on a startup to get there to get to this point where where it has pricing power where it has a near monopoly or a monopoly and a where you know where it kind of can do what he wants yeah and then you, if you fast forward the clock like 30 years like a or more like a Microsoft or an Apple or Google, like th these companies, they're like nation state size in, in, in their reach. Their global reach is incredible. They have employees and facilities all over the world and their valuations are outrageous. Like they're contributing not just to American political movements, but international political movements. Like they are, they are wily adversaries for the, for the government employees of the United States uh, FTC for sure. Yeah. Well, obviously, when you work for Apple, you work for Microsoft. I mean, these are great jobs, and and so the uh, yeah, there's a lot of beneficiaries in the system as well, and they have stock options, and they get wealthy doing this, and and so I mean, there, there there's a lot of there's a big you know part of the population of Silicon Valley, and in other parts where in Seattle and other parts where these companies are active, you know, there's a part of the population that have benefited from this. They had great careers with these companies and they've done lots of great things and, and uh, um, they've enjoyed what they're doing. And, and so it, it, and they're great companies to work for. I would think I never worked for them, but that's kind of what I hear. And, and so the, yeah, you have that side that uh, where you can look at the, the, the benefits that these companies have, have created for some people, you know, not for everybody, but for you know a relatively small number of people, they've created a lot of benefits, and uh, so you, you'll 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 have that, and and they've created a lot of investment, and 
and thank God Apple is an American company, not a Chinese company. And, uh, and same with Microsoft. Yeah. So this is in, in, a, in a way, you know, this, this, this is not all bad, but it's just gone way overboard. I mean, this is just ridiculous how concentrated wealth and power has become in these companies and individuals too. Yeah. That's an interesting point. Well, I want to zoom out for a second. Um, but before I do that, um, I'd be remiss not to talk about the car industry. I just have one question. You, I, I read on online and in talking to you, if you worked in, in what is it got, got to be one of the craziest industries in all of American capitalism, which is the auto dealership. And I was thinking about it the other day, like that is the worst consumer experience maybe of all time, like going into a car dealer, even like I, I went like um, seven years ago to buy a Jeep. I wanted to just buy something and not an expensive car and just pay cash for it. And they were so reluctant to meet for that transaction to happen that I still sat there for three hours. My, my whole goal was to get in and out of that car dealership in an hour. And yet, even if you're paying cash, it's three hours. What is wrong no, with wait, the car wait, dealer? Wait a minute. Not even if you're paying cash, it's because you're paying cash. Right. That's fair. Because the, yeah, they want you to get the finance product. Like, can the, why, why, I guess here's the question. Why haven't we seen that business model change in the last 30 years? Well, so this is a structural issue. And uh, the problem is that all four dealers sell the same cars. So there's no, no difference. And they all pay the same price to Ford to get those cars. They all have the same costs. So they, the only way they can compete with each other is by locking in the customers when they come in. And I mean, they can compete, they can advertise cheaper, cheaper prices on online or in, in, in the newspaper or on TV, but, uh, yeah, they have the same cost, so they have no advantage. They're just playing with the margin when they do that. And so when you come in, uh, they have to lock you in so you can't go shopping to the next Ford dealer uh, to buy the same vehicle, and they'll give you a $100 better deal, and, and you lose your deal. So um, the franchise system is protected by the state franchise laws. So the manufacturer cannot sell directly to consumers in the United States. So Tesla is an exception. It made a deal with a bunch of states, not with all states, but with, with something like 38 states, um, or it can sell direct to consumers. And it made those deals back when it was nothing. And, and when everybody knew for sure that EVs will never be anything and will never amount to anything and Tesla will go bankrupt. And so they let it do that. And so now we have this, uh, auto seller in the United States is manufacturer who sells directly to consumers and uh, now sells the number two uh, most, the number two best selling model, the Model Y and just behind the F series pickup truck. And so it's gotten a big deal and it doesn't have dealers. And it, uh, it has a huge advantage in not having dealers because it doesn't, it doesn't really have any competitors within Tesla. Ford has, Ford has created all, has 4,000 dealers that all compete with each other. And uh, Tesla doesn't have that. So it doesn't have to jack around with price and it doesn't have to lock in. Because if you want a Tesla, you, you buy from Tesla and then you pay the price that's, that's online. Yeah. And um, so with Ford dealers, he, he, you know, some, some Ford dealers try to, to fix pricing where, you know, the, the prices are non-negotiable. And if you're not a huge dealer, you will lose sales because Americans like to get a deal. They like to negotiate. And so they, you, you see the same vehicle you offer for $39,000, you know, maybe $5,000 of sticker price. And they go with this printed a piece of paper to another dealer and he says yeah i can beat that by 500 bucks and and uh, yeah and that's how the system works and america americans have have gotten pretty good at it, at playing it you know and that's that's why it's so hard to get away from some big dealers like auto nation and and some others uh have gone to no haggle pricing so you walk in and and the price that you see is what you pay and there you can't negotiate and um 
that's yeah, that's the largest new vehicle dealer in the country. And so that has some impact. Others have followed. Um, and but it's it's that's how the system is set up. I I when I, I ran a big car dealership and the, the franchise system was something that always frustrated me. It it was it, it, it's just really an outdated business model. But the dealer lobbies are very powerful and um, they're in each state. They have they're organized and they they uh, feel threatened uh, by by direct sales by their by their suppliers. You know, the Ford is the supplier of Ford Motor of, of Ford dealers. So if Ford starts selling direct to consumers, it's selling you know behind the dealer's back directly to the dealer's customers. And dealers are private individuals that invest it, and that's their business, and they want to protect it and want to make money and provide for their family and get wealthy doing that. And uh, so they're organized to protect the franchise system. And each time a, 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 an automaker tried to get around it, and they've all tried, you know, they, they weren't able to. And um, so we're stuck with that. Uh, that's kind of unique. Uh, other countries don't really have that system. And uh, the result is that buying a car in the United States can be a huge hassle for consumers. Uh, you don't really know what you walk into. This this idea that uh, you have to finance at the dealership because yeah, you know, dealership makes thousands of dollars when you do. So that that's yeah, the profit center of F and I finance and insurance. You know, that's the biggest profit center a dealership has. There's three guys working in it, and it is generating huge amounts of money. And um, so they're not about to give that up. And if you pay cash, you know, you, <laughs> you run into that uh, resistance there. And of course, the best thing to do is to say, yeah, I'll finance. And, uh, and you say, yeah, 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 to every loan payment and then whatever interest rate and whatever insurance to stick it all on there. And then after you walk out the next day, you cancel it all and, and pay cash for it. And you're done with it. And, and then they gave you maybe a better deal on the cash price. And uh, because they knew they could make it up in F and I, and you just canceled all that stuff, and and so, um, I mean, that's I'm going to try that. With it. I'm going to try that next time I uh, I try buy a car. That's fa- I'm really glad I asked you that question because I I just wasn't up to speed on this the the sort of regulatory landscape around the dealers, but it it makes sense, and I you know had noticed obviously that Tesla was selling DTC, but I didn't know the history, and and that's fascinating because. It's it's obvious like the future should be you should be able to go on your phone and buy a car at the at the set price direct from the manufacturer. That's obviously how it should be. And uh I guess there's just a, a lot of money tied up in these dealerships. It's gonna be hard to wrench wrench that away from them. Yeah. But yeah. that's really true when you think about it. There's a lot of independent business people, uh you know, four thousand four dealers and there's yeah. Many more uh, General Motors dealers and the different uh, brands, and and they're all across. Every import maker has dealers, and uh, so there's I don't know how many fifteen thousand dealers in the United States, and these are businesses. Now we had two hundred fifty employees, so it's a pretty good business. And we have parts and service business, and we had a, a wholesale distributorship, a big one, uh, that delivered into the multi-state area, and and um, you you pay people. Are, decent amount of, of income and then, you know, they make a living working at the dealership. And, and so all that uh, is really threatened when you sell direct. And then of course there'll be other jobs that at the manufacturer that do that, they still have to deliver the vehicle. They still have to clean it up and they still have to repair it and they still have to do all these things. It'll just be, it'll just be a different setup. But this, this, uh, yeah, this American institution of the auto dealer, uh, that's a highly protected, uh, entrepreneurial layer in, in American society. And, and, um, and of course in capitalism, you think, why, why, why do we need to protect them? You know? <laughs> and, and, uh, um, but we chose to do that. And so that's, that's where we are. <laughs> yeah. For, for what it's worth, testosterone pit is a great description of that. I had, uh, there was a brief moment in my life where I was a stockbroker and I had a client who was a big salesman at a Ford dealer and man, it, I, I loved, I loved him. He's a great guy, but they, they just live in a different world. It was, it was absolutely male dominated. There was all kinds of, you know, 
crazy bad male behavior happening in the dealership on a daily basis. So it, the name sort of makes sense to me at least. Yeah. Well, the testosterone pit, the, uh, the phrase, if I just throw that in here, came up in the book uh, when there's a couple of saleswomen and they walked up to a bunch of salesmen and the salesmen were out and they have nothing to do all day. When there's no customer, they stand around and they smoked and back then, you know, and, and just chatted and, and, you know, uh, drove each other crazy. And, and, and so these two women salespeople walk up to, to that group of male salesmen and, and one of them says to the, and one of them starts sticking in her purse. And then the other says, what are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for the, for the business card of the EPA I have in, in my purse here somewhere because, you know, and, and they said, why are you looking for the EPA's business card? And say, well, yeah, they're in charge of cleaning up testosterone pits. And so nice. that's where that came from. <laughs> I like that. Nice. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, so I was, I was on the verge of zooming out and asking you kind of a big question that may, may likely result in a bunch of different questions, but, if you think about your story that you shared with us today, you became a creator and started this website and, and started putting things out there in reaction to a pretty big moment in American history. And what was bothering you, it sounds, was the intervention of the government in, in the economy and markets. And so maybe the first question for you on this topic is how badly have we screwed up the economy via the Fed oh, and or the federal government or both, in your opinion? It's pretty bad. And uh, in an email back then, 2009, maybe, uh, I wrote, I don't remember the exact wording, but I, I wrote something to that effect. And I said that uh, what they're doing now is tearing up the country. And... Uh, and I, I didn't really have, you know, crystal ball or, or, or that was written in it, but I, I could see the underpinnings of it. And it's happened. You know, they have created an enormously wealthy, fairly small part of the population. And, um, and they've uh, left behind a big part of the population that are really struggling and um, with all kinds of issues. And, the anger is is not directed. It's not focused. That's the thing, you know. It's just, it's a conquer and divide. You know, they, they're, the anger is spread into all directions. It's not focused. So if it were focused, if it were focused on the one thing that caused it, it would be different. But now there's anger on the left, and there's anger on the right, and there's anger in the middle, and it all goes every which way. And and um, it um, it's it's you, you cannot throw trillions of dollars at a relatively small group of people um, and expect that the remainder of the country just just takes it in. And, um, and I think so that division that we now have originated back then. And uh, that's one of the things that, that uh, really got to me when I saw them doing this. And I thought, they're tearing up the country. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's the phrase that came to mind back then. And, and um, uh, yeah, so now we, we have this, this, this economy where the wealthy are super wealthy, unimaginably wealthy. And, um, and we have titles for them. Yes, yeah, instead of royalty, we have billionaires. And you see names with billionaire name, you know, you see that instead of sir name or or king and name, you know, it's billionaire and name. And um, we have uh, an adoration for the wealthiest people in the world or in America. And and it's created this whole sense that uh, there are a small number of people that have gotten everything. And and then, you know, the. And, then, and don't get me wrong, there's a huge middle class in America that's doing pretty well. Americans, most Americans, most meaning a majority of Americans are fairly well off. You know, 65% are homeowners and, and of the households. And, uh, you know, the pay is pretty good compared to other countries. 
and even Japan, I mean, you, you go to Japan and, and, and with the same job you have here, go over there and you make a fraction of your income. And, uh, uh, you know, that, so it's not that this is a poor country. It's not a poor country. It's a wealthy country with a lot of fairly well-to-do people. And uh, the lower 25% of the, of the income spectrum, they're really struggling. Uh, we have a huge homeless population. We have all those issues. Yeah. But we do have a very large, uh, fairly successful part of the population uh, and so th- 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 I'm, I'm not on the bandwagon and say everybody's poor in America, because that's not true. You know, that we have consumers that are doing very well and lots of it. And uh, but there's still this huge, gigantic division now. And we know that everybody, uh, if there's trouble, you know, everybody that's wealthy enough is going to get bailed out. So that's that's kind of the the, the, the the game we've seen. And and if you're not wealthy, you pay for it. You have higher costs, you higher housing costs and higher food costs and higher costs for your vehicles. So you 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 end up paying for it. And uh, uh, at the same time uh, that 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 others are made wealthy. And that's really um, that's a problem. It's a it's a huge problem. And uh and I think the the Federal Reserve is is to some extent realizing uh, what what these policies have cost. There's really more Federal Reserve policies that cost that than than government policies. Government policies didn't really cost that, but Federal Reserve policies did. And through the years of of quantitative easing, when they just printed trillions of dollars in total, you know, they they over those fifteen years they they printed uh, at close to nine trillion dollars and. And that's a huge amount of money that they created and threw out and they repressed interest rates to zero percent and came up with all kinds of distortions and inflated home prices, inflated asset prices across the board. And and with the result that people pay more of the income to do the basic stuff, to buy cars and to buy houses and to rent and, and to do those things. And and people that feel that every day in their lives uh, in, 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 in these ways, you know, and, and so... Um, that was started back then and, and it didn't, there's always this issue, but it just magnified it tremendously. Uh, I think that's a, 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 a massive economic and social problem in the United States now and, and responsible, I think, for a good part of the anger in the population and uh, on and on all directions. It's anger on the left wing, on the right wing, in the middle, everywhere. And, uh, it's it's based on on that back then they were they were really tearing up the country. Yeah, a lot to unpack there. And as you were walking through that, the question that I had, I guess, in, in the, the first question that came to my mind was, okay, America probably was pretty stratified going into the at least from a wealth and income perspective, pretty stratified stratified going into the GFC. And it obviously stepped up after. And one of the things I sort of understand at an intuitive level, but never, never quite got it like in depth that I've been curious to understand is how does QE itself exacerbate the wealth inequality problem? Like the, the actual mechanism of QE, right? Like the Fed prints money, they go and they buy bonds from the banks. Like, how do you see that that liquidity resulting in what we've seen? Like the data is pretty obvious. Like when QE is happening, wealth inequality goes up. But I'd love to understand a little bit more about the plumbing of it. Yeah, so uh, we really have to look at QE and interest rates at the same time. They're they're working together. They worked together, and. Okay. Um, so interest rates being the, the policy rates being down to zero. Uh, gave people that have access to these policy rates free money. And uh, that happened through like borrowing in the repo market. And the repo market is the largest short-term borrowing market in the United States. It's four or five trillion dollars a day that get exchanged there. And uh, the repo rates back then were very close to the federal resource policy rates, which which were just a hair above zero percent. So people could borrow short term in the repo market and uh, and then buy long term assets with it. So if you if you have essentially no cost in your capital, um, 
you can, you know, it really doesn't matter how much you pay for something and, and you buy, buy real estate and you buy stocks and uh, you buy companies. And um, so that, that drove up asset prices and uh, holders of these assets became wealthier because, you know, those asset prices went up. And that's that's across the board. So that's stocks and it's real estate and it's housing and it, it's it's just everything all the way through. And, and during that time, Bitcoin came out. You know, this is you know 2009. So um, it, it was kind of a reaction to that and it benefited from it uh, probably as much as anything. And uh, because people were buying Bitcoin, you know, and, and uh, just like they were buying everything else. And um, so that's the interest rate part. And then there is the QE part, which so interest rates are the, the policy rates are short term interest rates. The Fed sets are short term interest rates, and uh, that doesn't impact necessarily long term interest rate like a ten year, a thirty year uh, bond or a mortgage. And uh, those rates are more impacted by QE. So QE is when the Fed um, creates money. So money is. <laughs> It's a credit. You know, it's 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 not anything you can touch. It's it's a credit in the banking system. And um, so it creates this credit and puts it in the in the bank's account at the Fed. And then the banks have this and um, and they buy something with it. And um, so the the uh, the Fed would buy, for example, uh, Ten trillion dollars worth of government treasury securities from a bank. So the bank would get ten ten trillion ten billion dollars in these credits and would deliver those uh, treasury securities to the Fed. And then the the bank can use those ten trillion dollars ten billion dollars to buy something else. You buy stocks or buy other treasury securities, and so you do that spread across trillions of dollars, and you get a uh, a surge of demand for financial assets. And uh, there's all this liquidity chasing financial assets. So interest rates are yield. So how much you can earn on your on your uh, assets, that has plunged. So the you, you buy a 10-year bond, and by then the interest rate was 2% or something in 2009, or 1.5%. And... Uh, in, in 2020, uh, the 10-year bond in, in August 2020, during the big QE wave at that time, the uh, yield on the 10-year bond, a uh, 10-year note was was 0.5 percent, and uh, so you couldn't really earn anything. That the prices were so high that the yields were really low, and um, so. There was this chase for yield that these investors would would try to buy whatever they get their hands on to get some yield, and it drove yields down further, and it drove asset prices up. So, when, when, one thing we have to remember with fixed assets on real estate, you know that uh, with bonds is the same thing. You know, a higher price generates a lower yield. So, if you if you overpay for something, you you, you have a bond that pays, uh, you know, five percent. Yield on a thousand dollar bond, you get uh, you get fifty dollars in interest. Now, if if you bid up that bond to two thousand dollars, you still get fifty fifty dollars in interest a year. But now that's two and a half percent of two thousand dollars. So your yield dropped to two and a half percent because the asset prices was driven up. That happened in in financial instruments. That happened in real estate. So uh, uh, prices ballooned, yields went down, cap rates went down, and uh, uh, and it created a lot of wealth, and uh, in uh, with people that owned these assets, and we're talking many, many trillions of dollars. You know, there's uh, you know, 50, back then there was fifteen trillion dollars in the stock market, and and you know, fifteen trillion dollars in the treasury market, and there was you know, corporate bonds and municipal bonds and and money market funds. I mean, there's, 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 it's huge, the amounts are huge, and uh, and. That they were all these assets are owned. So when the asset prices uh, went up, the people who owned them became very wealthy. And the Federal Reserve itself uh, tracks uh, the wealth distribution. And I've covered that occasionally. And you can see that how when quantitative easing and interest rate repression, as I call it, set in, how the wealth of the wealthiest just ballooned, just, just took off. Woof. And, uh, and, you know, multiplying. 
and the wealth of the people that don't really have any assets that are working for a living and they may have a car and they may have, you know, some, um, you know, some things at the house and they may own a little bit of uh, real estate. Yeah, their wealth didn't really change much and uh, they just had to pay more for everything. And uh, so quantitative easing threw all this money in it and along with interest rate repression, you got this this uh, huge amount of uh, chasing after assets that drove up asset prices. And um, and since it stopped, you know, the, it really hasn't gone anywhere. Real estate hasn't across the nation. You know, real estate prices and housing has kind of flattened now. And some parts have come down a lot and some parts gone up. Commercial real estate is in trouble. Stocks are, you know, they reached a new high, but that, that, the old high was two years ago. And, and they're not much above that. And, and, uh, the Nasdaq hasn't reached a new high yet. So it, it's really leveled off since, since, since this QE ended. And, and so you can see that. And uh, uh, I think there's an understanding at the Fed that that cannot really keep doing QE. It just, number one, now we have inflation and it's not going away very easily. And number two, you cannot keep making the wealthy even wealthier. You just can't do that. It's just, you're, you're going to completely blow up the system if you do. Yeah. Well, th thanks for that explanation. Like I, the interest rate story, part of that story always made sense to me because I've been operating in real estate. And so I've, I've felt exactly that phenomenon you described, which is that when you can borrow for nothing, like it makes the deals way easier to pencil and underwrite. It's just basic mathematics. When the borrowing cost is low, it's easier to make sense of these deals. And so it, it did create this, this chase for yield. But I, I never really, I never really understood how the the QE funds themselves were getting into the financial system. So just just so I I'll make sure I understand it. So it sounds like when that transaction happens, the the basic QE transaction, which is the purchase of uh, bonds from the government from a bank by the Fed, they basically give the bank a credit with which to do something. And the banks were able to do either do loans with those funds or purchase additional securities. Were the banks able to dire invest directly in equities with, with that money? Well, there's uh, bank regulations that limit what banks can do. So it depends on, on the bank and, and uh, generally they, they don't really, but the, the banking system is the conduit. That, that you have to think of the banking system as a pipeline. That's that's where the liquidity goes through, and then uh, it it gets shuffled from bank to bank, and it gets shuffled to brokerages and to individuals. It gives it so once it's through the banking system, it, it spreads out, and um, so just just very basically, every bank in the United States has a sort of checking account with the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve is like their bank, and it's called the reserve account. And uh, so that's how when a bank pays another bank, they, they pay each other through their reserve accounts. And um, it, uh, their reserve accounts are incredibly active. I mean, there's trillions of dollars flowing through every day. And when you um, pay your mortgage to your mortgage lender, so uh, that money comes out of your bank and uh, it gets sent uh, to the mortgage holder with at another bank, and they all flow through the reserve accounts at the bank. So at the Federal Reserve, so one bank through another bank, and they pay each other once a day. Every bank pays every bank once a day. <laughs> yeah, and that, yeah, that's it's trillions of dollars, and uh, all transactions flow through there. And it's in these checking accounts that the Fed would put these credits. So that that that. Ten billion dollar credit for for those bonds goes into that reserve account, say at JP Morgan, and then JP Morgan delivers the bonds to to the Fed, and JP Morgan has you know ten billion dollars to do something with, and then it does something with it, buys more more securities, and then somebody else has this ten billion dollars, and they're buying something else with it. Yeah, so it it starts picking up momentum, and the the ten billion dollars starts circling around because everybody's buying stuff with it, and there has to be a seller on the other side. So if I buy something, somebody has to sell it to me. The seller gets the money and then the seller buys something else with it. And uh, it may be not a security. It may be real estate. And it may, and then the seller of the real estate buys something else with it. And so it created this, this, this 
a kind of tornado of money going through the economy. And it's not the initial act of printing money that causes this. It's once the money goes out there and starts chasing and flowing around uh, and it doesn't go away. You know, it just keeps getting handed around. Every buyer gives this money to the seller and the seller does something with it. And, and it, you know, goes from there. And uh, it, uh, it, so it's not that one act of giving $10 billion to JP Morgan for $10 billion in bonds. It's what happens afterwards when that $10 billion uh, enters the financial world and, and starts swirling around. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. And it, it, it makes total sense. It's like, if you, if you go into that moment in history with a stratified society, the problem, like it sounds like the fundamental problem with QE is that it is an intervention that essentially is by design only possibly able to help people who have assets because it's not like the banks are going to like give a bunch of consumer loans with that money. Like they're going to play, you know, try to earn money by dealing with Blackstone or this, you know, with that extra funds that they, with that extra credit that they have at the, in the reserve account, they're way more likely to deal, do business with someone with assets than they are to, help a sort of ordinary American consumer. So it, it, it makes sense to me in that, from that perspective. Well, it was actually, you're right. You know, it was actually formalized that way by a Fed chair, Ben Bernanke in 2011, he wrote an editorial in the Washington post, which, <laughs> which I keep on my computer, on my hard drive, you know, in case the Washington post ever takes it down. And he explained that system to the American people, uh, back then. And it's a, uh, it's a doctrine that the Fed calls wealth effect. And uh, it's well established. It goes back a decade or more before the financial crisis. There are all kinds of papers on it. And uh, uh, Janet Yellen, when, uh, when she was uh, president of the San Francisco Fed, she wrote about it. It's a paper of her uh, discussing the wealth effect. And the wealth effect, the doctrine says that uh, the central bank can make the wealthy, the asset holders wealthier. They can create wealth through through money printing and interest rate repression. And so the wealthy people that have these assets become wealthier, and then they spend some of this money. And as they spend this money, it uh, props up the overall economy because it's part of consumer spending. So maybe they're they're buying a new house and, and or they're building something, building a castle, or buying a, a yacht and and uh, and a new vehicle, and and they're splurging on other stuff. And hopefully, the yacht is made in the United States somewhere, and so there'll be jobs and people make money. And so this is the whole theory of the wealth effect. And Ben Bernanke explained that to the stunned American public that the Federal Reserve is purposefully making the wealthy even wealthier so that they feel wealthy and feel rich and spend a little bit more of their money and, and you know, hopefully uh, prop up the economy. And the wealth effect has a very, so this is an official doctrine and there's all kinds of economists that have written about it. So you, you can Google that. And um, it has a very spotty record. In, in terms of helping the actual economy. It, it, it has a very solid record in terms of making the wealthy wealthier, but the trickle down effect of that wealth effect is pretty small. And, uh, and you end up with this huge div division in wealth. And so, yeah, that's the principle that the Fed did this on is the wealth effect. And, uh, and personally, I think the wealth effect has been discredited. I think it's bogus. Uh, it's a it's a fake doctrine, and um, but that that governed the Fed's action at the time, and it was well established in economic literature, and uh, and Bernanke explained it to the American people, and uh, you know so it, it's not something the Fed did secretly. It 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 discussed it. You know, it said this is what we're doing, and this is why we're doing it. We're going to make the wealthy wealthy, and hopefully they spend a little bit of that, and it's going to help the economy. And, uh, yeah, that, that was the theory. I, I think the current uh, Federal Reserve thinking uh, uh, is different. I have not heard anything about the wealth effect. Some of those wealth effect papers have been taken down, and I can't find them anymore. I still have the links, but they don't work anymore. And uh, uh, especially a couple of those at the San Francisco Fed, they're gone. And, 
Uh, so yeah, no, nobody has mentioned that for the last few years. So I, I think that that theory is no longer the case. We now have quantitative tightening, the opposite. Uh, it looks like they're going to keep doing it for a while. Uh, interest rates are reasonably high at five and a half percent at the upper end. So uh, this is a different scenario now, but we're talking about the past here. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're running short on time. Are you, how, how do you feel about just like two more questions? Okay, I'm good. Okay, cool. So just have to ask this because we, we just spent so much time getting into it and, and it's fascinating that the, the Fed is taking these papers down. That, that's probably the subject of another episode in and of itself. But do you think there's anything just sitting here today right now? Let, let's say you and I were in charge of the, the Federal Reserve. Is there any way out of this? What can, what can we actually do to get ourselves out of this like doom spiral towards massive wealth inequality forever and quantitative easing forever? Yeah, I think uh, the Federal Reserve right now is actually doing the right thing for change. You know, and I'm, I'm on record for a decade of just lambasting the Federal Reserve and and hating it and and you know slugging at it and and back in 2021 i called it the most reckless federal reserve the most reckless fed ever and you can google that it's right up there at the top you know because they were still doing qe and having zero percent interest rates as inflation was taking off and that was just ridiculous but so now they're on the right track and high interest rates uh they need to stay high they need to probably go higher than that because inflation isn't Inflation isn't going back into the bottle voluntarily. You know, it's, it's, it went down a whole bunch last year, uh, thankfully, but it's coming back up now. And, and uh, uh, so I think that that's good policy and they're seeing that and they're being careful with that. And, and quantitative tightening is the right policy and they've been doing it. They, they did a lot of it and they keep doing it and uh, uh, they need to keep doing it. So I, I think it's important not to do it too fast to be careful with it because when you withdraw liquidity, you can have all kinds of things blow up because liquidity doesn't, doesn't go where you need it very quickly. Eventually it will go where you need it because yield, yield does that. So something where you, if you need liquidity, you know, there, there, you have to pay a higher yield and eventually you get liquidity if you pay a high enough a yield, but uh, that's not instant. So if suddenly you need a lot of liquidity in one corner of the economy and and the, the flows don't react fast enough, something can collapse. And that could be a bank, it could be the repo market, it could be something, you know. And, and so I think it's, it's not a bad idea to carefully watch how much liquidity you take out per month, for example, to, to make sure it's not too fast, to make sure the flows can adjust. And, and, uh, and I think and they're, they're talking about it and I think that's good. And um, so I think they're on the right track now that what I would do if I were at the Fed, I would just keep doing that. I would not uh, buckle to political pressure and to Wall Street. Wall Street hates quantitative tightening, just hates it. And they hate these high interest rates. And there's a lot of pressure on the Fed to cut rates and a lot of pressure on the Fed to quit quantitative tightening. And um, I... I, if, if I were the Fed chair, you know, I don't know that I'd have the balls to do that, but I, I would just say, well, you know, this, this is a new era here. We're, we're going to keep doing this. We're going to carefully withdraw liquidity and we're going to keep interest rates high. And we're going to allow some of the excesses to unwind, um, hopefully more or less gradually. And if there's a liquidity problem with a bank, we may help out uh, briefly. But, uh, you know, overall, this is a new world and you have to adjust to it. That's, that's how I would approach it. And I'll probably get fired the next day. <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends who's president. Well, maybe not. Yeah, you, you probably get fired no matter who wins. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. Do you think they got to go all the way and unwind every bit of QE? Or is there just like, you just got to take out enough and then we can get back to a, a, a regular functioning kind of system? And so there's a complicated question here. Uh, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, like any balance sheet, has assets and liabilities. So we usually talk about the assets, but so the, the bonds it has and uh, the mortgage-backed securities, that kind of stuff. And uh, the liabilities are really what determine the size of the Fed's balance sheet. And there's four big liabilities on the Fed's balance sheet, and, and uh, two of them 
can come down a lot all the way, but the other two are demand driven and the Fed cannot control that. So the, the four are the government's checking account at the Fed. So the general, the treasury general account, the TGA, that's where the, the government keeps its cash. That's, that's around 700, 800 billion dollars. That's a lot. So that, that means on a balance sheet, uh, everything has to balance. So the liabilities plus capital always have to equal the assets. So if, if you raise your liabilities, your assets have to go up. And if you lower your liabilities, your assets can go down with it. And so that has to always balance. So the, the TGA account, the Fed doesn't control. That's the government's uh, decision to keep cash on hand. You know, and that's important to have enough cash for government. And uh, then... Uh, currency in circulation. So those are the paper dollars you have in your pocket. They're called Federal Reserve notes. Uh, there are uh, there are little IOUs that the Federal Reserve gave you. So if you walk into the Fed and say, "This is hundred bucks here," I I I won't get some for it. You know, it's it's that thing. So this is demand driven. There's two point four trillion dollars of this paper currency out there. Uh, Apparently, over half of it is overseas. Uh, it's used for all kinds of purposes, legal and illegal, and people hoard it and they have suitcases and mattresses stuff with them. And uh, so when you go to the bank and you ask for $100 in cash, the bank has to have this money on hand and has to give it to you. And the bank gets it from the Federal Reserve, but the bank cannot buy that cash. It has to exchange it for collateral. So for like treasury security. So if a bank wants to get a hundred million dollars, hundred dollar bills from, from the Federal Reserve, it has to give the Federal Reserve a hundred million dollars in treasury security. So some other collateral, and it gets a hundred million dollars of hundred dollar notes. And uh, so those Treasury securities that are collateral posted by the bank, those are assets for the Fed. So that $2.4 trillion in currency in circulation has an equal amount in assets on the Federal Resource Balance Sheet, so in, in securities. So now we have the TGA, $800 billion, and currency in, in circulation, $2.4 trillion. So that's $3.2 trillion dollars that the Fed has to have in assets to counterbalance. So that's that's already that. So that's a total absolute minimum. And then the Federal Reserve also has some other assets on its balance sheet, such as the some gold and some different things. Yeah. And then the two other liabilities are uh, the reserve accounts. So that's money that the Fed owes to banks. And uh, uh, the uh, overnight reverse repos. So that's the money the Fed owes money markets. And the overnight reverse repos, that's that's a short term. Uh, yeah, that, that's where money markets deposit money at the Fed to earn 5.3 percent interest. And that's short term. It's come down a lot. That can go to zero. It was zero before that can go to zero. It was during the peak. It was two point three trillion dollars. Uh, now we're down to less than five hundred five hundred billion dollars. And that can go to zero, so that that can be gone. Then there are reserve accounts, and they will always have some cash in it. They have to have some cash in it. That's the liquidity of the banking system. And uh, last time we the, the Fed did QT in 2019, it ran into a problem with the reserve accounts. They dropped to 1.4 trillion, and that's when the repo market ran out of liquidity because the banking system refused to lend to the repo market, and the repo market blew up. So that's that's the thing. So they the banks need to have enough liquidity so that they're encouraged to lend to the repo market and to other entities. And um, uh, so there have to be the term is ample reserves. And nobody knows how much that is. But we know last time it blew up when they were down to one point five trillion. So maybe now it's two trillion, a little more than that. And uh, so you have. $3.2 trillion in the TGA account and in the currency in circulation and maybe a couple of trillion in, in the reserve account. So that's $5.2 trillion. And so probably once once the total assets go below $6 trillion, you're going to hit that minimum. That just It's just required for the economy to operate for the, in terms of the Fed's balance sheet because you have the liabilities, you have the assets, they have to balance. And... Uh, 
you know, the Fed never had zero assets. From day one, it had assets. Before the financial crisis, it had $800 billion in assets. And it, it continued to, over the 100 year, 110 years of the Fed's life. It, it has continued to grow, essentially, with currency in circulation. And now we have the, the government's checking account. The, that's another story. You know, the government's checking account used to be with JP Morgan and with some other banks. And during the financial crisis, they got scared. <laughs> they yanked the money out of those banks and put it on reserve, on, on deposit at the New York Fed. So the New York Fed became the banker of the government in 2009. And, uh, that swelled up the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. Yeah. You now you've got all the cash from the government there. And, um, uh, so uh, that's changed. Yeah, that's not the, the government's not going back to J.P. Morgan. So that's a permanent change, and the government. So that's why we can't go back to eight hundred billion. We've got currency in circulation. We've got the TGA account, and then we've got the reserves. So it, um, yeah. To, if we get down to five point five trillion, I think that will be very that will be very tight. It will be good. I'd like to see that. Uh, I don't know that we'll get there. We're at, at around seven trillion now, and a little over seven point four trillion, maybe. So um, we're we're down about a trillion a year, and um, the, you know, for the Fed, that's a long term project. I think it's a good idea to slow down as you as you come down, so that you don't remove liquidity too fast, and allow this liquidity to to go where it's needed. And uh, um, yeah, so. People will say, I want the balance sheet to go to zero. That, that, that's not, that never was zero. It can't go, it can't, can't happen. And it can't go back to 800 billion either, but it could go back to maybe five point something billion. That's maybe. I'm really glad I asked you that question because you just sort of delivered a, a tour de force explanation of that. And it, it makes me optimistic because I have never really dug into the weeds of this central bank balance sheet stuff. So I just assumed that the task was so insurmountable because the, the Fed, the QT numbers are like 30 billion or whatever, whatever they were or whatever they are. And we're talking about trillions upon trillions of dollars that were, were put into the system in QE. So it, it felt like a Herculean impossible task, but it sounds like the way the math works in the plumbing that once you once you do QE like they did, the genie's out of the bottle in some cases on the balance sheet. Like some of this money is just permanently going to be in our system, and we maybe we could get back to a decent spot before too long. Really, I mean, if we're at seven and to get to six, it doesn't seem crazy. Uh, and maybe that's enough to if they keep interest rates like you're suggesting. Maybe that's enough to drive this inflation out of the system uh, yeah. for good. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not hopeful that inflation will be gone quickly. I uh, I remember back in the 70s and 80s, you know, it, it took a long time. And even after inflation came down, it was still high for for another 15 years. It it wasn't 15 percent anymore, but it was still five, six percent, four percent for for a long, long time. And, you know, my first mortgage was eight percent. And I got a great deal because I bought from a bank uh, who had uh foreclosed on the on the condo and the bank was collapsing and he was making me a below market mortgage deal and you know uh, half a year later the bank was taken over by the fdic and a local bank in oklahoma and, and that's how it was back then during the oil bust and and uh eight percent was a was a great deal inflation was four or five percent at the time and and uh, so there was not in the late 1980s. It's still we're still having four or five percent inflation, six percent, and uh, and and eight percent mortgage rates. Yeah, that's 15 15 year mortgage. So that's yeah, that's, I loved having it. Yeah, that was a great deal. I was really proud of it. Yeah, <laughs> things have changed, right? Wow. Well, we're coming to the end, and. I, I want to I want to just throw this out there because I feel like there's so much ground that we didn't cover. Uh, we got to do this again. I feel like there's a lot that you could help my audience understand about this really complex stuff that part of my goal, sort of one of my missions for all of this content work I'm doing, podcasting and writing is to try to try to bring to light some of these topics because I feel like not enough people are talking about them. So I appreciate what you do and hopefully we can do this again. And I uh, encourage everyone to follow Wolf Street. Another fascinating thing about Wolf for the audience is that 
early in his career, he, he took a pause and traveled to uh, 100 countries, every single continent, and was gone for three years. And, and I can't leave this interview without, without at least asking one question about that. And, and maybe we could leave this as like a cliffhanger for like, what else did Wolf learn uh, in that journey? But what, what's one thing that stands out like that you learned on that trip that has informed the way you're leading your life today and, and listeners could take into their lives to, you know, make it better. Well, the biggest lesson was probably going through Africa. So I went through 25 countries in Africa over land mostly. And so that was 1997. There's no cell phone and there's no electricity in a lot of these places. And you're in the back of a truck and, and uh, with the locals and uh, you see life from a very different point of view. And uh, you, you don't leave that behind and go back to like how you were before. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. And uh, you just kind of changed after you go through that. And um, it, it made me ultra aware of the human condition of what we do, what we are, and uh, of the immense uh, divide in wealth that we have in this globe and and and, and in this world, and and um, it, you know, it's there. There, I didn't find any solutions or anything. It, it it's not that kind of thing. It just it just burns your your brain in a few spots, and and um, uh, yeah. The, I mean, the, the lesson I've learned is, thank God I did this. Uh, yeah, it changed my life. I, thank God I did it when I did it, which was when I was, you know, just turned 40. And uh, uh, I wouldn't want to do it now. You know, this is, number one, the world has changed. You know, you can't really do that anymore. You can't get lost in Africa anymore for, for six months. You know, there's the cell phones everywhere now. And and you can go there with your cell phone and and, and yeah, you know, keep posting comments. Google online. Map. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it was a it was a super fascinating experience. I'm glad I did that, and I could not go back to where I was in my life, and my life changed completely. It took a U turn, and and I'm the best thing I've ever done. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like that kind of experience is fertile ground for for thinking about serious issues in life. And, it, you know, I don't know you that well, but just in the last couple of days got to know you. it seems like it's, it's like come in full circle in a sense where you had that experience and ended up years later having this emotional reaction to something that on the surface doesn't really seem related to that, to like an experience of going through Africa, but it kind of is because these policies that you're writing about and are upset about, they contribute to the, the scenario of, of real human condition on life, right? Like we're talking about numbers and it's, it's easy to get lost, but at the end of this, end of every one of these statistics is a human being. And some people, you know, as a result of these policy decisions are doing fantastically well and they're going on vacations and other people are not. And it's important that we keep that in mind as we pursue whatever we're trying to pursue in this life. So yeah. thank you for uh, coming here and I hope we can do this again sometime. Thank you, Nick. Anytime. <laughs>